Well, I've been looking forward to today for, for a month or so now as we've been anticipating starting this new series, uh, studying uh, the book of Ephesians. We will be studying verse by verse, we'll be studying chapter by chapter. This will take us right through the season of Lent, right into Holy Week. Uh, what's particularly exciting to me about it is not only are we going to be studying the entire book of Ephesians on Sunday mornings, but on Wednesday nights, man church, that's what we're doing. We're, we're really digging deep into God's word, Ephesians. Uh, and then on Wednesday nights, you ladies are doing the same thing. So I'm excited, but by the end of, of this uh, 12 weeks or so, I hope you know Ephesians well. And I hope it's life changing. And I hope some of you will even memorize parts or maybe even all of the book, all six chapters. So to that end, with that excitement, then I begin today's message on Ephesians. Ephesians is one of uh, four books that are, are, are informally referred to as the prison letters. The prison letters. Now I'll tell you why uh, by telling you a story. This is, um, if, you, if you know maps, if you know your geography, you already know what this is. But this is a, a map of, of Asia Minor and, and part of the Middle East and the Greece, as you see, and then, and then Italy and Rome would be a little bit off of the map. If you can picture this, if you can imagine this with me, in the year approximately 62 AD, Jesus had walked the earth and then been crucified and, and had defeated death and walked out of the grave just decades prior. The year 62 AD, and there are four men, four men leaving Rome with letters, uh, perhaps papyrus scrolls, letters strapped to their gear. Four men leaving Rome, headed for Asia Minor. And if the Roman government had known of the world changing significance of those four letters penned by a prisoner, interestingly, if the Roman government had known of the power and the significance of those four letters that were being carried out of Rome, uh, they never would have let them go, I suppose. And these four letters, carried by these four men, uh, are now known as the prison letters. The letter to, to the Ephesians, the one we're going to be studying over the next 12 weeks. Uh, a letter to Colossae, the church in Colossae. Uh, a letter to the church in, in Philippi. And those three letters would have been broadly dispersed. They would have been read uh, by people, uh, perhaps outside of the city, and perhaps by all three of those churches. And then the fourth letter was a personal letter to Philemon. These four letters were uh, were were uh, delivered. What did I do here? There we go. They were delivered. They were they were carried from Rome, approximately 62 A.D. They were carried to Colossae and, and Ephesus. And, in Philippi, and then one personal letter went to Philemon. Epaphroditus carried the letter to Philippi, Tychicus to Ephesus, that's the one we're studying, Epaphras to Colossae, and, and Onesimus to Philemon. There are great similarities uh, in, in all four of these letters, really, but, but especially between Ephesians and Colossians, and, and what I what I delight in, what I really find encouraging, is the fact that, that the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians and, and the letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians may have been penned simultaneously. Simultaneously may have been penned at the exact same time, but no doubt within the same year. And there are all sorts of similarities. What was what was burning in Paul at that moment in time? He expressed. He couldn't help himself. It was borne out in these two letters, and therefore there is there's great similarity. 
We know from Acts chapter 9 that Paul's, or 19 rather, you can read that later. In fact, I would encourage you to go read Acts chapter, I believe it's 18, 19, and 20. If you'll read Acts chapters 18, 19, and 20, you'll see, you'll read of Paul's dealings with Ephesus. And it was kind of rough and tumble. He went to the synagogue first. His heart was, was, was for, the, for the Jews, for his, his people. Like it was in just about every city he went to. He would go to the, the synagogue first. He was so frustrated. He was so uh, beside himself with, with the lack of receptivity on the part of the Jews in the synagogue. And ultimately he went, he went somewhere else in, in Ephesus. And, and there was a house church. And there were a dozen Gentiles. And there were no doubt some, uh, some, some Jews there as well. And from that he spent two, actually probably three years in Ephesus. Pouring into the men, the elders. Pouring into the ladies who were who were serving and, 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 and planting and, and, and evangelizing. And he spent those years in Ephesus. An interesting side note, you can read this later, but when he first went to Ephesus, he asked, he asked 12 disciples there if they had received the Holy Spirit and they believed. And they said to him, this is in Acts, in Acts 19, they said, We haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. So he explained the gospel to them. And they were saved. They were converted. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Acts 20, we read of a tender moment of friendship. Paul was headed to Jerusalem. He knew that perhaps he, at that point he would be bound and he would be imprisoned, sent to Rome. Uh, so he was headed to Jerusalem, perhaps his last trip, was his last trip to Jerusalem. He thought it would perhaps be his last trip. He wanted one more opportunity to say bye, say goodbye to the Ephesian elders, those men who had planted alongside him in Ephesus. And he called them to a port town. He didn't even, he didn't even have time to go to Ephesus. He, he called them to a port town. And you can read it in Acts 20. He had this, 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 this tender moment in which he told them, I will never see you again, men. Carry on. Lead faithfully. Lead, feed, and, and protect the flock. And they wept. And it says mostly they wept because they knew they would never see him again. I think of one day how I might, for the very last time, see the elders at River Church. And I wonder, I hope that, that, that if we were to know that was the case, that they would weep for me. That our bond of, of brotherhood and friendship and love would be that intense. Now I want to point out a point of repetition that we find in, in Ephesians and in Colossians. We're not studying Colossians over the next 12 weeks, but it's important for us to see, some, see this point of repetition. You know, when someone repeats something over and over again, it's meant to be considered as important. I'm not sure that my children have understood, have completely learned this yet, but when I say something over and over and over again, it's not because I, I'm, I'm failing or, or I'm, I'm growing old, it's because it's important. And I want to make that point. And that's the case here with Paul. Repeatedly, Paul speaks of a mystery. He speaks of a mystery hidden by God for the ages. But he's not talking about some weird numerology thing or some, some cryptic uh, deal that you could write a book on one day because you've got the market on the mystery that no one else has. No, he's speaking of a mystery that has unfolded that he now has been charged by God through the Holy Spirit to unfold for the church. He says there's a mystery hidden by God for the ages. Uh, he also refers to it as a mystery hidden by God for the ages, but now revealed in Christ. Just look at a, just a brief portion of Colossians. He says the mystery hidden for the ages but now revealed. If you want to know what else it says, you can go and look there later. And then Ephesians speaks of it again. He says, and this is God's secret plan. This, this, this mystery, and here's, here's the plan. Here's, here's the mystery hidden for the ages. It says that both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news 
share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. The, the mystery revealed is that the church is now the recipient. That's us, folks. The church is now the recipient of the same promise that once that was once thought to be reserved, not for the Gentiles. It always was intended. God said from the beginning to, to Abraham, I will bless you and in my blessing through you, all the peoples, all the inhabitants of the world will be blessed. The good news, we now share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. What does that mean? That means that all of the promises in God's word are for you, dear children of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says so. It says all the promises of God find their yes in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus' work on the cross means that all of God's blessings now are inherited by you. They're for you. And that's significant because that, that's what we're going to be talking about mostly over the next 12 weeks. So today, week one, we're looking at, at the first chapter, but we're looking at really in first chapter, only verses 1 through 14 is our spiritual blessings in Christ. You would join me. You read, you read silently, and I'll, I'll read out loud. Here we go. Beginning of, beginning of Ephesians. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you. Peace to you. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, we should be blameless before him in love. God predestined us for adoption to him as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were first to hope in Christ, he's, he's, he's realizing, claiming the fact that he's, he's Jewish. So that we, first of all, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you, the Gentiles, also when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believe in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. It was a long passage, I realized. That's why we unpacked it uh, 10 days ago, men, and took an hour and a half, and that's why you ladies unpacked it this past Wednesday night and took an hour and a half. And so today I'm gonna do my best with the time that we have to, to open the, the richness of, of God's word to but know that it's there. It's there on your uh, on your table when you get home today. You can open it up and read it again. And what we're going to camp out on today is the fact that, that, that there are spiritual blessings in Christ that Paul is is compelling us to realize, compelling us to believe. 
We hope for so many lesser things, the astounding promises of the gospel should, should captivate us. Our spiritual blessings in Christ. God has blessed us in Christ with every necessary spiritual blessing. I want to diverge from the text for just a moment. I want to talk to you about imprinting. Imprinting. It's a, it's a term used in biology. It's a term used in the sciences. And I'm going to give you a rough layman's idea of what this is. Imprinting. Imprinting is a powerful force. Imprinting, just a, a rough, rough sort of definition or explanation. Imprinting happens when one animal comes to realize another animal as a parent or as the object of habitual trust. You, you're my mom. I'm just like you. Whatever you are, that's what I'm going to be. And, and regularly, regularly, habitually, I'm going to trust in you. Imprinting. When one animal comes to recognize another animal as a parent or object of habitual trust. Imprinting refers to a critical period of time early in an animal's life when it forms attachments. It develops a, a concept of its own identity. What in the world? Why not? You, you, you understand just the whole word I'm doing. Birds, birds are known to be born with a this, this pre animal ma mammals as well. They're both born with this pre-programmed drive to imprint on their mother. But every once in a while, apparently, a, a duck is born at just the wrong place at just the wrong time. And it comes out of its eggshell thinking, I'm a dog. <laughs> and when the mailman drives, drives by, and it quacks and it barks as best it can, it walls down the sidewalk trying to, trying to catch them. When you drive into the driveway, it comes and it, it pecks at your tires and it gets all, all ruffled and bothered because it sees, it sees the dog doing that. And, and by golly, I'm a dog too. And sometimes we, dear friends, sometimes we too become confused about our identity. Do you see where I'm going here? Sometimes we too are confused. Second uh, Corinthians 5 says that in Christ, I mean, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Therefore, how, how significant, how important, how, how relevant is it for us to understand as new creatures who God has called us to be, what he has blessed us to be, the, the, the destiny, the, 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 the makeup of who we are, all that God has designed us to be and to do. Some of us are really confused. We think we're something else. We've, we've claimed the name of Jesus Christ, but we haven't really, really embraced or put on the identity of Christ. So this study of Ephesians will be good for us. We will discover who we really are. If, if you are in Christ, it's a phrase that, like, that Paul likes to use. If you are in Christ, then it's important for you to understand, for, for us to understand who we really are in Christ. So the beginning of this letter, Paul is an apostle, it says, an apostle of Christ Jesus. And he's writing to the saints who have been set apart, it says, set apart for God's work. And the, the takeaway, 
one of the men in, in our in our Bible study ten days ago pointed this out and thought it was so good. It made it into the made it into the, into the sermon manuscript. The takeaway: this this is a formal greeting meant to cause us to, to take to take notice to say, okay, now, now this is significant. This isn't some ill-planned text message that, that you can you can take with a grain of salt. No, this is. Paul, Paul is, is writing, for, this is a sit up and take notice, sort of an opening paragraph. And then Paul gets to the main point. The main point for which he's now going to, 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 to write for, for, for a whole chapter, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Would you read just that phrase with me again, starting with bless us in Christ. Let's read that together. Let's go. Bless us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that again. I'll say the word has, and then you join me with bless. It says that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Today, all we really have time for is to look at four spiritual blessings. There are four blessings that jump out of the page to me. I, you may see others. No doubt there are others there. I understand that you as ladies on uh, Wednesday night, you found some other blessings in there. I want to point out for me, Four big ticket items, four blessings that I see in, in these 14 verses. The first would be this. We are adopted by God. Verse 5 says that. In love, He, God, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. In adoption. child is brought into a family. In adoption, a child is given the same rights and the same privileges and the same responsibility as a child born into that family. There's no two tiered uh, sort of levels or childhood status in the family. The, the, the adopted child and the natural born child have equal status. And Paul's pointing out, he said, you're not, you're not less than. You're not like stepchildren to be kicked around. No, you're, you're an adopted child of God. Some of you here today in this room have never really had that close, loving relationship with a parent. Maybe you felt abandoned. Maybe you felt like an orphan. Maybe that's bled into every other aspect of your life where you've never really felt like you belonged, like you fit in, like you were on equal footing. What Paul is saying is that, that in, 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 in God's economy, in God's kingdom, in God's family, you're not a hired hand. You're not a servant left to do God's bidding. You're a child of the living God. And the crazy truth is, He determined to adopt you before the world was ever created. He already knew you. He already chose to adopt you. Not because of anything that you had done, anything that you hadn't done. Only because of his goodwill and his loving nature. He has adopted you. He has welcomed you no longer an orphan, no longer abandoned. He has welcomed you into his family. You are now a child of the living God. In some sense, Scripture say this, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. 
four spiritual blessings we're looking at. The second one is this. We are redeemed by God. The redeemed is not a word that we use real often, just in in uh, in the, the the normal comings and goings of life. Um, if you're about my age or older than than it was a word we used to. I always here's what I think of when I think of redeemed. I always think of of coupons. Like the, the little coupons, man, back in the day here, uh, I should have studied up on this before I got up here today. Uh, back in the day when I was like a little kid, you got green stamps, is what they're called? Little, little, and, then, and then you would take them back to the grocery store and redeem them for uh, like dishes. Am I getting that right? Am I getting that right? Yeah, green stamps, that, that's a thing of the, yeah. You gotta be my age or older, even know what I'm talking about. But I'll give you a more relevant story. Uh, every once in a while, on Sunday, I have to get like batteries for this this uh, this, this pack, or I don't know, I need a cough drop or something. And I'll stop at CVS on uh, Sunday, Sunday morning. Uh, Sunday morning, I'll stop at CVS on my way here. It's pretty early, and I go in, and I'm always confused because I always forget until I visit the next time what's going on. But their ladies that have these file folders full of coupons and they're like doing a deal. You know what I'm talking about? Like like they're going out with like 10 bottles of uh, dishwashing detergent and 20 sticks of, uh, of uh, not butter, uh, deodorants, that's what, was, that's, that's what they want. Uh, and like, and, and they're giving them money. Like it's, they've got, they've got a racket on the coupon market. They've, they've cracked the code. What are they doing? That, that took way too long. Uh, what, what are they doing? They're, <laughs> the point is, they're redeeming coupons, right? That's the word, redeem. Redeem. You, you could say to buy, say to buy back. The, the, the NLT version uh, s s uh, interprets this uh, passage by saying that, that he has... He has purchased our freedom. We have been redeemed. And then we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Redeemed. It means that God has bought your freedom. That God has bought our freedom. Freedom. To be redeemed means to be to be bought, to be to be purchased. And and when when something is is purchased, when that sort of transaction takes place, when, when something is purchased, there are two items involved. There are two items involved. There, there is something given as as payment, like currency. Something given given to, to pay the price, like money. But there's a second there's a second uh, item involved, and that is whatever is received in exchange for the payment. So if I give you a uh, a a get out of free jail card, remember those from the Monopoly game? Then, then that's the payment. And what am I buying? My freedom. So what is purchased in this passage? What is purchased is our freedom from guilt, our freedom from sin, in a very little, in a very literal sense. You, my friends, are no longer guilty. So why do why do some of us carry around so much guilt? I, I know you. Why why do some of us? Carry, carry around so much shame. Your past does not define you. That's what Paul is trying, is compelling you to believe. You've been redeemed. You've been bought back. Your, your freedom has been purchased. Don't answer out loud. Just answer in the quietness of, of your own heart. But, but, but who or what still enslaves you? Your past? 
Is it just too much for you to escape? Who or what enslaves you? Is it your critics? Those who judge you, those who condemn you, is it your family? God has bought your freedom. What still enslaves you? Is it some particularly fond and comfortable sin pattern in your life? What enslaves you? You are no longer enslaved. God has brought, bought your freedom. He has paid the price. And the price was paid. What was the currency? What was the, the payment? It was Jesus' blood on the cross. Listen, I, I, I tell people this all the time, and, I'm, and I've told you about these instances. I have men on my, on my boat, and I'm guiding them, and we're fishing, and, I'll, and, and somehow, naturally, often, the, the conversation will go to Jesus. And I will speak of the blood-bought forgiveness that is, that is the story of the gospel. And I will say to them, look, that is a crazy cosmic story that I couldn't have written, and I wouldn't even believe it myself. Except the Holy Spirit has given me the faith to believe. So I know for some of you here today, the sense is, I am so wretched, the things that I've done are, have, been, have been so destructive, I, I just can't imagine forgiveness. And I understand that. Paul understands that. And he compels you to believe that Jesus' death paid the price that you couldn't pay for your sin to, 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 to buy you back. Another, another descriptive description of, of our condition is that we are dead in our sins, but no longer. Now we are made alive in Christ. Your past does not define you. Christ has bought you freedom. He has made you alive. There's a third blessing. And that is we are given an inheritance. In Him, verse 11 says, in Him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We have been given an inheritance. Now let me ask. You raise your hands if you dare. Probably no one should, though. Uh, who here has a rich inheritance coming from your family uh, when somebody dies? When, when, when Aunt Millie dies or when Uncle Joe Bob dies, you've got like five million dollars coming your way. And the answer, <laughs> the answer is not, not, not many of us. Like I, I know where you live. Uh, for, for some, I guess, I guess maybe that'll change after Millie or Joe Bob dies, right? But, but, but I think I, I think I know it's well enough to know that not many of us have five million or fifty million uh, <clears throat> coming our way one day. We're not, we're not the recipients. Of that kind of inheritance. What Paul compels you to believe in today's passage is that the inheritance that you are a recipient of isn't less than what I just described. It's it's way more significant. Like the <clears throat> the, the monetary amounts that I spoke of a moment ago, like that's chunk change. Because you'll only be able to enjoy that for about 80 years. The inheritance that Paul describes is way more significant. Astoundingly more significant. Most of us in this room probably feel poor. You ever feel really poor? Maybe you think of yourself as poor. What Paul says is you are rich. God has set for you an inheritance, a, a destiny, a future, a, a hope. We have received an inheritance. Now what is that? What do we inherit? 
Interestingly, one of the men pointed this out on Wednesday night. Uh, interestingly, uh, the, the, the tense in this passage is past, that we have received an inheritance. I'll get to that in a moment, but, but, but in one sense, yes, we have received this inheritance, but it's this already not yet sort of theology, like we've received it, like a deposit, but we have not received it in full. There's more yet to come. We have already received the inheritance, but we have not received it in full. Perhaps we could say it this way. The inheritance that we receive in Christ from God, what we have actually received is a deposit. Like God says, you are now, you are now a child of the living God. You now walk, like you walk on this earth, but, but, but really, Really, you, you have dual citizenship. Your citizenship actually really is in heaven. And so you're actually uh, living in the kingdom of God. Yes, you are weighed down by the troubles and the stuff of this earth right now. But you are also uh, a, a, an inherit a, a recipient of this inheritance, a child of God. You are a kingdom dweller. And so you, you receive the deposit. Oh, but don't be fooled into thinking this is as good as it gets. This is not your best life unless you're planning to spend eternity apart and separate from the Lord. This is not your best life. You, your best life is to come. We receive an inheritance, but we receive a deposit. Now, I want to I get to the next, the next promise because it, it really speaks to the, it, 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 it unfolds this more fully. The fourth, the last promise we look at this, uh, this morning is that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Another, another passage says we are sealed. And another translation says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In fact, this one actually says the, 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 the ESV. It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Christ, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now hang on every word that we read in verse 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of of his glory. Well, well, verse 14 is game-changing sort of speech. What is, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying this. Paul is saying, yeah, you already got the inheritance. Yeah, not fully. Yeah, it's a guarantee, but more is to come. And then in verse 14, he says this. You have received the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is a guarantee. The Holy Spirit, in other words, would be is a deposit of our inheritance, like a promise, like here's a taste Here's a guarantee, here's a deposit, until we acquire full possession of it. And we should respond, oh, come, Lord Jesus. The language here, the Holy Spirit is, is the guarantee of our inheritance, like the word deposit, like when you make a deposit ensuring that you will come up with the rest of the money. Like, you'll, you'll, like, a, remember, bought a house or been around uh, around that sort of transaction earnest money now when when, uh, <clears throat> when Lydia and I when Lydia and I bought our first house and by the way I was thinking about this yesterday I was at the rodeo uh, or I was at the, the, the fair and livestock show and there are guys and, and ladies driving like F-350s and I told my kids I said that, that vehicle costs as much almost as much as the first house that we, we actually purchased. Uh, but when Lydia and I, we were young, we were, I don't know, we were a little less than 30, when we, uh, when we decided to buy a house, you know, they tell us like, like they, they, they're like, wow, we qualified for that much money. You know, that, that's, that's really game. Like, wow, we qualified for that. Uh, 
we didn't use all that we qualified for, but we, we went and bought a house. And then they asked us, uh, after we qualified so much for so much, and I was walking around, my, my chest all puffed out. Then, then they asked us for this thing called earnest money. And I said, earnest what? And they said, yeah, you have to come up with like $3,000. And we didn't have three grand laying around. We were young, like 28 years old, with one child and another one soon on the way. And we were living on a single income. Come to think of it, no wonder they wanted to deposit from us. They, they must have looked at us and said, there's no way they're going to be able to afford this house. Um, they wanted a deposit as a guarantee that you're going to be, you're going to make good on your promise to pay the rest. Dear friends, that is the Holy Spirit. That is what Paul is saying. That the Holy Spirit's activity in your life, it's supposed to jazz you and say, Ah, it's happening. Sanctification is happening. I'm not who I once was. It's like when I'm out driving on my motorcycle and somebody cuts me off and I, and I don't get angry that time. I'm like, wow, I didn't get angry that time. I mean, it's just a silly little example, but I say, I, like, I used to get so angry, but I'm not as angry anymore. And I would say, that, that's not me. It's the Holy Spirit in me. Or perhaps the, the Holy Spirit, perhaps the, the Holy Spirit visits your life in some supernatural way, through some supernatural giftedness, and you say, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit in you. And what Paul says is, that is the guarantee that we will, in the future, receive the full sum of the inheritance that has been promised us. It is coming. It is yours. So what does this mean in real time for us Christians? It means that anytime you see evidence of the Holy Spirit in your, in spirit in your life, you should be super encouraged. You should be jazzed. Like I said we, we we have we have much more we can talk about today than we have time to talk to. Um, so so let me just let me just ask you this: If this is our new identity in Christ. If all of these promises find their yes in Jesus Christ for us, if we have been purchased and adopted and we received an inheritance and we've received the Holy Spirit in our lives, if that is our new identity, what difference does it make? How do I stop living like a dog start living like a duck, if you remember the, the, uh, the story I told you earlier. How do I start living? How do I truly identify with Christ? I realize that all these promises, they're for me. All these promises, they're for you in Christ Jesus. You have no reason to live like a slave. You have no reason to, to live like a peasant or a, a dog or an impoverished stranger or a higher hand, hired hand. Uh, I'm an adopted child of the living God, and, and he has bought my freedom and, and, and my eternal destiny, and, and all is guaranteed with this earnest money, with this deposit, this guarantee. We've been chosen by God to be a spiritual children. Now, I, I don't pretend to believe that, that we, that you and I, friends, can, can fully comprehend the magnitude of these blessings. I suppose we can. But don't you think we ought to try? If we could understand and believe in these blessings, our, our way of living would no doubt change. The things that you pursue with your deepest passion, and you know what they are. The things that you pursue with deepest passion, if you really believed that these blessings were are for you, they would shape your passions. They would they would shape your pursuits. They would shape your life. 
C.S. Lewis once said, the staggering, or spoke of, the staggering nature of the rewards promised to us in the Gospels. And yet we piddle it as though they're not that astounding. So I'll give you this and we'll, we'll run to the table of communion where we find mercy and grace. Here's what I would encourage you, the direction that I would encourage you, and this is the application. Number one, rest in God's love. You, you may feel unloved uh, by the world's standards. You may feel alone and lonely. Learn to find that place of resting in God's love. Number two, see yourself as someone very significant. We as the church often create a, an environment which we don't, we don't even feel significant. By the world standards, I'm not using I'm not using significant by the world standards, but but think on this: all that God has done for you, His mercy and His grace toward you, His goodwill toward you, it says something. It says that you are significant. And, and number three, <clears throat> I encourage you to enjoy being part of God's family. We. We often run to the world's parties and the world's clubs and the world's organizations and we want to fit in and we want to find uh, esteem and want to, we want to be established out there in the world and I understand that, but, but guess what? You, you belong here. You have status here. This is really your home. We're your people. We're like a family. I hope that doesn't weird you out, but we're like a family. God's family. And the fourth encouragement I would give is thank God that he took the initiative. I'm so glad that he didn't wait until I was born and watched me for the first 20 years of my life and be like, yeah, I guess Randy's worth it. I'm going to go ahead and pursue him. No. No, because what if he would have said, eh, Randy, doesn't, Randy doesn't meet the standard. I'll just, I won't pursue him. I'm so thankful that, that he took the initiative in relationship. I didn't have to chase after him. He chased after me. Amen. Let's pray.